Thanks for listening to the Susie Larson Live podcast, available thanks to support from listeners like you. It's only just a matter of. Welcome to Sizzy Larson Live. Always, always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His amazing and real presence in your life. Well, my guest today, along with his co-authors, traveled around the world, conducted over 100 hours of interviews with today's leaders in the church, from those serving in war zones and refugee camps to billionaire leaders whose lives are grounded in prayer. They conducted these interviews to learn about the prayer practices of today's amazing leaders. They got to sat, sit down with leaders like Francis Chan, John Mark Homer, who we've had on the show, John Orberg, we've had on the show, Tim Mackey, Gary Haugen of I. JM, Johnny Erickson Tata, and Mark Batterson, both of whom have joined us on this show. So what did they learn? Well, they learned something powerful about the power of prayer, the practice of prayer. Ryan Skoog is my guest today, and he's here to talk about his amazing new book titled Lead with Prayer, The Spiritual Habits of World-Changing Leaders. And boy, oh boy, do we have a show for you. Get a handful of copies of this brand new book if you'd like uh, just to be inspired um, by leaders who really take it seriously, who make time and space to meet with God. Text the word book to 877 933 Two four eight four. Quick announcement. You've been hearing about this, but I'm going to say it again. There are children growing up in extreme poverty all over the world. They're desperate for your help. Jesus loves these children. He loves his children. And as you read in Scripture, you see he's got an incredible heart for the widow, the orphan, for those who are oppressed and living in, in poverty. And if you are able to sponsor a child, you could change their life. You could teach them about Jesus, give them vital medical care, nutritious food, and they learn valuable life skills that help them overcome poverty and change the world. You can meet children right now waiting for sponsors. You can read their stories, see their faces at our website, myfaithradio.com. All right, now let me tell you about my guest. We'll get him on the show. Ryan Skoog is co-founder and president of Venture.org. We've had Paul Herkman on the show a number of times. This is a nonprofit that works in the toughest places in the world, serving war refugees, trafficked people, oppressed children, and the unreached. Ryan is also a serial entrepreneur who co-founded several travel technology companies and co-authored the books Chosen, a 30-day devotional, and the one we're talking about today, Lead with Prayer. He and his wife, Rachel, enjoy adventuring with their two ginger-headed kids. Ryan, I was you, 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 I was going to tell you, and you beat me to it before the show, we know and love so many of the same people, and you are held in such a high regard. It's about time I met you. Welcome to the show. Oh, I, I was going to say the same thing about you, Susie. I have so many good friends that say so many amazing things about you. It's an honor to be here. It really mm, is. Wow. And I told you this off the air as well, that you've done a phenomenal job on this book. So I'm excited for it to be launched out into the world for people to get their hands on it. Before we dig in and talk about it, though, we love to start the show every day with the same question, kind of zooming in and making it real personal. But just in your time with the Lord, which I know you take very seriously, what's mm. he been talking about these days? Oh, awesome. I actually... So every day, one of my practices that I learned uh, from the pr- praying leaders is I roll out of my bed onto my knees every morning. Mm-hmm. I just want to start with a posture of humility before God and a posture of prayer. And what, what I really have been taking lay for, away from the recent times of prayer is the idea of friendship first. The idea that instead of just giving my list and, and doing my duties, it's just being with Jesus. And he said, I, I don't call you servants. He said, I call you friends. And it's out of that friendship, it, the fruitfulness of our life can flow. And so the Lord's been teaching me a lot about not rushing to ask or rushing to petition or any of these other parts of prayer, but to stop, to pause, and to be with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's been how, one of the greatest, greatest uh, um, discoveries in prayer in my life. I was just going to say, how has that changed how you walk with God? How has it changed your perspective of God? Yeah. So I, I would say that if you if you look at like sometimes we feel this weight of what we have to get done and when you truly can cast your cares as it says in the scriptures you know lift those boulders unto Jesus and spend time t- just waste time with him is a phrase that one of our friends uh, used he said friends just waste time together 
And out of that friendship, I'd say some of the greatest fruit of ministry and some of the greatest things have happened out of my life, out of truly not having an agenda with Jesus, but just wasting time with them. Uh, literally entire ministries uh, that we've done at Venture have come out of that just being with Jesus. Hmm. Can't even tell you how much I love that. I think we got to have you back on another day. I want to dig into the stories in your new book, but I want to have you on another day for people to hear your backstory of how you got sure. here and how God has just raised you up to be such an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial leader in such a time as this. So I mean, feel free at any point, though, to weave those parts of your stories in today's conversation. But I want you to just talk about how this idea of traveling the world to interview key leaders, how that was born in your heart. Yeah. So it actually was started with a deeper question. And the deeper question was, what would happen if we sat at the feet, the, the Western church sat at the feet of the global church and said, can you teach us how to follow Jesus? Because the global church is exploding in ways that are absolutely unprecedented. In fact, missiologists are saying that they've never seen anything like this in Christian history. Praise God. That we are seeing an explosion of the church like never before. And so even greater than the early church in many places of the world. And so what is behind that explosion? And we thought, why don't we sit down at the feet of the global church and learn from them how you know, what, what it means to follow Jesus? And instead of learning some leadership principle, we found that the foundation and the base, the fuel of what was do, going on in their areas was a prayer life, not just a, a principle. And so that started spurring inside of me is what... What does it look like to pray as a leader? And in Samuel, there's this line where Samuel says, God forbid that I sin by failing to pray for you. And it struck me at that moment. What Does God hold leaders to a different standard of prayer? And I, I look up and I see my leadership book library, and it's filled with leadership books on how leaders lead, how they schedule their days, how down to the micronutrients they take every day. We get that detailed. And there's nothing about how leaders pray. Mm. And there's a, a study done by uh, one of the, and I'm just kind of going off here, but there's a study done by one of the largest foundations in Christian foundations in the country. They spent over six figures on a study trying to find out the habits of praying leaders. And they, 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 after the study came back, it was the results were so dismal that they never even published the study. Wow. Because in, at least in our context in the West, we're not praying. <laughs> And, wow. and so that, it's a, it's a crisis level. In fact, LifeWay did a study and found that 70-something oh, percent of Christian leaders say the number one, one of their number one challenges is they need to grow in their prayer life. They know they need to grow, but, but people aren't talking about how leaders pray and how they pray and mentoring. And yet when the disciples came to Christ, the, very, the one question we have is not how to teach, how to lead. The one question we have is teach us to pray, Jesus. Because that's they saw that as the fuel of his life and ministry. This is why these conversations are so important. I think if you're a Christian living in the West, we've got listeners all over the world, but if you're a Christian mm -hmm. living in the West and you've known in the last decades, America has been known, and even North America, Canada, for sending missionaries out. I think we're so used to having that posture I love the switch of your posture saying we've got to learn from the global church because they're expanding while we're contracting really right now. Mm, uh, so, so I true. love that. And uh, to imagine that that we would humble ourselves to say, teach us. And I've been hearing stories like Muslims coming to faith in record numbers, quantifiably more than anything in other decades past. And people mm -hmm. are seeing signs and wonders, bodies healed and, mm, and people yeah. being convicted over their sin. I mean, it's a wildfire, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Now, I, I got to be in a room just a little bit ago in Dubai with underground leaders, and every single one of the leaders had over 10,000 churches under them. And these are all <laughs> in persecuted countries. And so I, I really felt like I was sitting among the angels, you know, and wow. in that room. And every one of them, and, and, and really, again, the idea of, of prayer guiding things, they were meeting for strategy. And one of them said, I think we're supposed to just pray the rest of the day. And all those leaders instantly stopped the strategy planning meeting, got on their knees, and they prayed for hours. And that gripped wow. me so much. I thought, that's there's something there. And so that's what kind of launched this journey. And so we were able to sit down with leaders, like you said, uh, over 100 hours of interviews with leaders from six different continents whose leadership covers over 100 countries and find out that there is actually patterns. It, like the Holy Spirit leads any in, uh, leader who's trying to be intentional about their prayer life 
the Holy Spirit leads us to a similar prayer habits. And we saw a, a lady who was serving in a war zone and a, a billionaire business leader and Francis Chan all having similar prayer habits. And so the, the, every chapter of the book is these patterns that emerged, these habits that emerged that were truly universal and wanting to learn how the Holy Spirit truly leads leaders into a, a dynamic prayer life that becomes a foundation for all their ministry. Hmm. Did you notice any common denominators? Well, you just said that there was a, a there was a similarity, but as far as any yeah. core like practices that were like, wow, I'm seeing this across the board. Absolutely. That in fact, every chapter is a common denominator. That's why we chose the chapters as we thought, man, we're seeing everybody do this. We're seeing everyone do this. These are going to be the chapters. And so I would say, uh, I'll just give you a couple. Um, one of them was the one I shared with you, that idea of friendship first, where they all have a time to just be with the Lord. And uh, a lot of them, it's, it's through a walk. So Rose, um, uh, one, of our, one of our partners out in the war zone, she takes a walk, Francis Chan. He says, I'm a busy guy, but I have to spend time with my Savior. And so I just go out and I walk and I talk to Jesus. And uh, well, that, that phrase I used about wasting time, that came from a, a New York financier who's over billions of dollars, but he prays like a monk. He's praying all the time throughout the day. And, and, he, and he says, yeah, I, I have to have that enjoyment first where I just waste time with the Lord and, and just be with Jesus. And he said, the things that Jesus speaks to me in those moments when my heart is not wound up, when my heart is at rest, are some of the most powerful things as a leader. So that's one of them. But the other one was... They all are ten intentional about their prayer life in the sense of if you're a leader, you're intentional about your schedule and you're looking at your schedule and maximizing your schedule. Well, what they've done as leaders is they craft a day with God. What are my morning routines of spending time with Jesus? What are my afternoon? What are some throughout the day? What are some evening routines that I'm going to do? And they start, one, of the, one leader said, I set my prayer life. And I schedule everything else around it. And, and that, that intentionality and guarding a day with God, you know, the old, uh, old um, centuries ago, they used to call it a rule of life, or we can call it a personal liturgy. What is the, the rhythms? So they're very intentional about that. And then the, then the other one that we noticed in a pattern was this idea of practicing the presence of God, how they, they really stopped multiple times throughout the days and, and created really bells, if you will, reminders to stop and just keep remembering the presence of Jesus. Um, so those are just just a few of the patterns. I, I don't want to go off, and, and there's chapters that dive into examples on each one of these areas. Wow. You know, this dear Gwen texted in, she says, not having an agenda with Jesus. I love that. She said, the dear lady at Bible study today just reminded us how important it is. Just be still. Our world's so busy, so overstimulated. Mm -hmm. Just think if we could sit and be still with the Lord, we'd hear from him. And this dear one you know, said, friendship first. That alone will radically change my prayer life. But I'm listening to the end. Thank you. That's from yeah. Lene. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. There's a, wow. there, on that one topic, if you don't, can I tell you a story? Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a Mother Teresa story. She okay, you know was, what? I don't want to interrupt what? your story, so I just did. But we're going to take a yeah. quick break because I want you to Let's be able to tell it in full. And uh, yeah, we're going to pause here, take a break. When we come okay. back, we'll hear a story about Mother Teresa. And friends, I really do want you to lean in because we've been talking lately about kind of upping your game. In other words, engaging, making more time and space for the Lord. And if you remember last week, we talked to Rob Reamer about that, creating the sacred space for that f uh, flame to just burn brightly. And I just think this is the, the continuing message because it's an invitation from the Lord. Ryan Scoog is my guest today. He got a brand new book, amazing book. He he writes like he speaks. These stories will inspire you. It's called Lead with Prayer, The Spiritual Habits of World-Changing Leaders. And you don't have to be a leader to read this book. It's just so amazing to see these people who've impacted and are impacting the world have a private prayer life that's a priority. And we can all learn from that. Text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a minute. Hi, I'm Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. Jesus loves little children, all the children of the world. And right now, there are children in desperate need of Jesus, in desperate need of food and medical care. This is your time to become their champion, to change their life 
When you sponsor just one child, you plant seeds of hope in their heart, and you work together with people on the ground to change the families, communities, and the future for these children. You might not be able to change the world, but for one child, you can change theirs. Would you prayerfully consider sponsoring a child today? You can meet the kids and find your child at MyFaithRadio.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, talking to our friend Ryan Skoog, who is uh, co-author of an amazing book titled Lead with Prayer, The Spiritual Habits of World-Changing Leaders. And uh, every one of us can make prayer a higher priority in our lives. And you're just never sorry. When you're seeking, when you go beyond seeking his hand and you go to seeking his face, uh, as Ryan says, it's seeking friendship first before you are seeking, uh, you know, you do bring your petitions eventually, but the idea of, I want to know you for you, God, not as a means to an end, but as the beginning and the end. It will change your life, no matter how long you've walked with God. If you want in on the drawing, text the word book to 877-933-933. 2484. So Ryan, uh, you're about to tell a story about uh, another, a modern day Mother Teresa. Yeah. So, well, first let's tell a story about Mother Teresa. And she was interviewed one time by a, a, a newscaster and a national news. And he said, what, what happens when you pray? And she says, well, I don't do much. A lot of times I just sit there and listen to Jesus. Hmm. And he says, well, well, what does Jesus say? And she said, well, not much. A lot of times he just sits there and listens too. <laughs> and if I, and she says, and if, if, you, if you don't understand it, I can't explain it any other way. But there's this, this beautiful, the beautiful mm. idea of just being in the presence of Jesus and that intentionality that fueled her, her whole life in ministry. And, uh, and, and it's very hard because uh, there's a, 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 a psychological study that was done recently about putting somebody in a, like a white wall blank room. And they had a button that would give an electric shock. And they were given a choice, either sit in the room alone for 15 minutes with their thoughts silently or push the button and receive an electric shock. And over two thirds of the people would rather have an electric shock than sit alone for 15 minutes. Wow! So that's why prayer is hard. We have to train ourselves. And yet at the same time, this is uh, some of the science we found behind prayer is that prayer physiologically changes your brain in such a way that you can see it on a brain scan. Just 20 minutes of prayer for over eight weeks can change the synapses in your brain in the areas of compassion and joy and, and, and all these other areas, so much so you can see it on brain scans. So prayer is actually physiologically and scientifically changing our bodies when we do it. It's beautiful. Wow. Wow. In the book, you talk about a pastor who cried as he shared how they were forced to take stones from their church and use them to build Mm. their own prison. Uh, Tell us that story, if you would. Yeah, yeah. So I I tell people the the first interview and the last one happened to be the most impacting personally for me. So I'll I'll tell you the first one a little bit later. But the last interview was with uh, Mark Batterson, who wrote a wonderful book on prayer. And he Mm -hmm. said that he was able to look at his grandfather's prayer journals and when he saw them, he started bawling because his grandfather was praying prayers that were being fulfilled in his life two generations later. And the concept of prayer being a generational activity was so powerful. And it was illustrated more beautifully than ever by a story of a friend of mine who was on a mission trip in, into Russia. This is about 20 years ago. And their mission was to take the stones of a gulag, a Russian prison, and take those stones and use them as the foundation to, re- to build a church. It's this beautifully redemptive mission. And while they were doing that, there was a, they were lifting the stones, they found a canister and they grabbed the canister, opened it up, and inside was a note. And they took it to the pastor and they said, look at what we found. And the pastor read it and started weeping. Mm. And the note said this, it said, we are a group of Christians who are being forced against our will to take the stones of our church and build our own prison where we will die. But we're praying that one day these same stones can be used to rebuild a church. Hmm. And that's exactly what they're doing a a couple generations later. And so that's what we do when we pray is we're literally throwing canisters in for generations to be answered. God never forgets a prayer. 
and he's listening and acting. And we might not see it now, but our prayers can affect generations from now. It's so wow. beautiful to think of the power of what we do when we hit our knees. If we could really understand what a not only efficient God, but what a multiplying God he is, that he so moves on our faith. He moves mm. on our faith. And uh, you write this, every prayer we pray is like hiding a canister in the rubble of this world. Friends, hear that again. Of all the things we can do with our time, this isn't condemnation, this isn't shame, but it's invitation. Hear this again. Yeah. Every prayer we pray is like hiding a canister in the rubble of this world. Prayers that a loving Father has promised not to forget. As we pray for our families, organizations, staff, and those we seek to reach with our ministries, we can slip our prayers into canisters for future generations. And as we train others to pray, their prayers too will go on for generations until we see the culmination of all our hopes, prayers, and dreams in the face of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. That, if I weren't having to stand behind my mic, would put me right to my knees. That is just stunning when you think of it. And that's why, don't you think God wants us to think of the long game? Oh, it's so, yeah, it's such eternal work. When you think of the trade-off, many times people go, man, as a leader, it's hard to make time to pray. But if we, if we truly understand what we're doing and who we're talking to, then, then it should be the other way around where we have to make time to do our work because we're so busy talking to the king who's got That's right. all the resources of heaven available to us. And that was one of the leaders we interviewed. He said the entire resources, all of them of heaven are available if we simply tap into them. Why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't, Why wouldn't we, we spend more time in prayer? So, so beautiful. You know, at the open, the introduction of your book, you know, Billy Graham was one who founded this radio station, believe it or not, when he was wow. the president of the university across the street. We love Billy. And uh, we've had Ann on plenty of times, his daughter, Ann Graham, lots. But you opened I was in just the talking inter- to his grandson uh, an hour ago, Stefan. Oh, Chividin. oh, wow. What a Billy small Graham's world. Grandson. Wow. Yeah, okay, I love that. What a- Great, great family. Well, you opened the introduction of your book with this story about Billy, and it cut me to heart. I mean, as a speaker, this cut me to heart so much. But I don't know if it was the security guy or who it was, but they were panicking, going, oh, great. My one assignment was to keep an eye on the speaker, and I've lost him. I don't know where he is. And he goes off to find him. He's out kind of, I don't know if he's outside or somewhere, but he's on his knees crying out, oh, God, I can't do this without you. I can't do this without you. He's crying out to God, Billy Graham, to speak to about 15 people. Uh, Speak to that, if you would, because that dependence to me is breathtaking. Yeah, Yeah, that, I mean, Billy Graham, you think is that of anyone who could wing it, you know, in ministry or go up and sit and talk to a group of leaders for a short period of time, it would be Billy Graham. But instead, he took every opportunity to get on his face and say, I have no power in myself. It's only in you, God. And that gripped me. that, That was so convicting to me to think that you know, that there was the source of Billy Graham's power, not his talent or his strength or his ability. But as the scriptures say, don't boast in your riches or your, your strength or your talent or your wisdom. Boast that one thing that you know me. And it truly, he lived that out. And I, I use that story as a metaphor that uh, the security guard went out, you know, checked the back alley, came back in, and he had lost Billy Graham. And I feel like we're in a moment where we, as the church in the West, we've lost the spirit of Billy Graham, that dependence mm. on God. Mm. And so we've lost Billy Graham and it's time to come back. And so we wanted, that's the, the impetus of this book was to create the roadmap back to that Billy Graham style dependence and prayer on, on God wow. and letting the fruit come out of our, our friendship with Christ versus our own activity, our act, overactivities. You know, we have a propensity to just rest on past laurels, don't we? I mean, not not just mm-hmm. leaders, but all. Um, when you've walked with God a long time and you get to know the songs that you sing and the words in your mm-hmm. Bible and you know your way around the church, it is just so easy to phone it in and you don't even realize the disconnect. And I often say, when you go through the motions, you disconnect your heart. And when you disconnect your mm-hmm. heart, you disconnect your faith. When you yeah. disconnect your yeah. faith, nothing's happening in the spiritual atmosphere. Like when you literally are worshiping, saying, I am not a slave to fear. I am a child Mm. of God. And you declare that, things change in the atmosphere. And I think we have to understand who we are, right? When we pray and what we say. Yeah, we have no idea what we're actually doing. There's another story of a leader that he had a a prayer time in the afternoon and a a world leader was actually going to visit him. And he came to this leader's uh, secretary and said, hey, I'm a little bit early. Can Can he meet now? And she said, no, I'm sorry, he's finishing up his prayer time. And the, and the leader says to him, the secretary, do you know who I am? And she looks at him without missing a beat and says, do you know who he's talking to? I love it. 
and and that I that same idea of like yeah. let's switch the perspective a little bit of what are we actually exactly. doing um, when yeah. we, we have no idea. And I I, I just uh, I love the way the scripture the the Hebrew word for prayer is this ter- uh, it's a word palal, and it's it's in a weird tense. It's in a tense of something that you take a step and it happens to you. So like you jump in a river and the river takes you, or if you step into a shower and the shower happens to you, the word prayer for prayer in Hebrew is you you start to pray and then something happens to you. It's wow. This thing. Yeah. And that's, that's you know, thousands of years old. It's written into the, the actual Hebrew word itself of prayer. That is amazing. Well, one of the things you said in the book is that leaders often instinctively lead out of their strengths. And wouldn't you think if you zoom out 30,000 feet uh, in a broader way that most Christians, we default to our strength before we'll default to dependency on God? Uh, would you say that's probably true? And if so, why? I know it's true for me. That's why I wanted yeah. to go on this yeah. journey. And I, I, I share that I'm not an, uh, an expert in prayer by any means. I'm just an enthusiast. Uh, you know, you can't be an expert in humility. Or you can just be an enthusiast. And so I, I, that's why I love sitting at the feet of all of these leaders. But yeah, that's in my, my tendency, all of our tendency, the river flows one way, and that's to be more dependent on ourselves and to be busier and to, to forget heaven, even though we're trying to work to see heaven here. And and we need we need the example of leaders. We need Christ. In fact, here's here's a study for you. When we studied the prayer life of Jesus, there's this phrase they would use about how he often withdrew away to to wilderness to pray. And that mention of him withdrawing away to the wilderness to pray increases when his ministry increases, not decreases. Wow. So when the crowds get bigger and there's more responsibility and there's more people to lead, the twelve, the seventy-two. He gets he draws away and prays more, not less. And and I, I heard someone just say, "Do we think that we're better than Jesus? That we can we can we can do this stuff without prayer? Like it's just right. a great idea of saying no, no." And 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 so the the the, uh, the funny that here's another fun Greek moment, but the the phrase he often withdrew away and prayed. It was actually in this tense where it says Jesus was a withdrawal away and prayer. Like it said that that he did it so much. That that became who he was. So, like, there's a difference between like someone who golfs occasionally and, and a golfer, and the mm-hmm. difference is how often they do it. Or there's a difference between like someone who complains every now and again, and there's people in your life that they are a complainer because they do it so much. And yeah, what it's they baked said, in. yeah, it's baked in. And so Jesus mm-hmm. was a withdrawal away in prayer. He did it so much that it was who he was. And uh, I who and for me, I think, oh man. If if Jesus had to, then I, I I'm, not, I'm not better at this than Jesus. I should be praying more as things increase, mm. not less. And that's tough. That's I, I need I need friends and challenge and accountability. And that's why we did tools in the book. Um, we actually have all kinds of tools to help people start incorporating prayer from prayer cards, uh, where you can grab a handful of prayer cards like a deck and and start. Um, they have scripture on one side and an interactive prayer on the other side. And you can just pull out seven or so, and they take maybe five, you know, six minutes each. And anything that I, any tool that we can give to help people extend that time in the presence of God, is going to change everything. Because once leaders pray, imagine what can happen if leaders truly started modeling prayer and creating cultures of prayer where they lead. Wow. When we come back, I want to talk about this beautiful tension of moving out of self-preservation, which I always say kingdom life is and self-preservation are not compatible, but moving out of that, putting yourself in a position to have to need God. One of our, our favorite guests we have on every month, Jamie Winship, has so many incredible stories to tell. And people have texted in and said, I want a story to tell. And he says, well, put yourself in a position to have to need God, and then you'll have a story to tell. So on the other side, I want to talk about just the the, the juxtaposition of faith and obedience coupled with dependence and prayer, because that's when stuff happens. If we're trying to protect ourselves from all injury, from all pain, you know, insulate ourselves so nothing bad happens, we're not going to see a move of God. But if we put ourselves in a position to have to need God, and then we pray like we need God because we do need Him, that's when we start to experience God. So we're going to talk about that on the other side, talking to Ryan Skoog, who, who regularly puts himself in a position to need God. And he's co-written a book, amazing book, Lead with Prayer, The Spiritual Habits of World-Changing Leaders. You can text the word book to 877-933-2484 to get in on the drawing, and we'll be back in a minute.
Thanks so much for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live, having a really fantastic conversation today with Ryan Skoog. He co-authored the book, Lead with Prayer, The Spiritual Habits of World-Changing Leaders. They've got over 100 hours of interviews. They interviewed John Mark Comer, Mark Batterson, Gary Haugen. He's the founder and president of International Justice Mission. We've had IJM reps on the show before. Leaders who are uh, ministering in refugee camps and leaders who are billionaires who who just spend all kinds of time on their knees. And they just found this these common denominators of prayer practices of people who make prayer a priority. And uh, before I get to the question I set up before the break, you know, I asked about common denominators with these, and you mentioned, you know, just some of these common practices of people, friendship, pursuing a friendship with God first, of seeking his face more than his hand, of making space for him to walk with him. What about um, leaders who go on it, go on their own strength, who are resting maybe on past laurels, who are relying heavily on their giftings within the church? Have you noticed uh, common denominators amongst them at all? Yeah. And so real quick, you're asking about, have I noticed, um, not the example leaders, but notice leaders, that what happens to a leader when they're depending on their own strength? Just want yes, to clarify. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So real plainly, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Right. You know, he, he laid it out there. And I had one leader who was so convicted by this process of starting to go through this prayer, pray like a leader journey. And he said, I realized I thought I was busier than Jesus. And if wow. Jesus had to pray, I can't be, I'm not busier than Jesus. And, and if Jesus was dependent on the Father's strength, what, I'm not stronger than Jesus. And, and, and the conviction of the prayer life of Jesus started you know, really c- taking over his heart and drawing him back to dependence and reliance. But I, I think you really hit the nail on the head when, when you said the global church is exploding at an unprecedented rate, and yet the church in the West feels a little bit like there's some decline. And I do not think it's a coincidence that the global church, when they say pray, they are talking about a rich, powerful, extended prayer life. And when we say pray, a lot of times we're talking about dusting on the, to something that we're doing, you know, little pixie dust at mm, the very end. Mm. And, wow. and that, that difference between how the global church prays and the, we, the difference between we pray, I am postulating and the book is postulating that that might be the reason we're in a bit of decline and the global church is exploding. Wow. So here's my original question that I set up before the break, and I I hope I can phrase it in a concise way, but I feel like Mark has been a a good friend of the show, Mark Batterson, and we love him, and and he lives this way. You live this way. I know you do. Uh, But people who dare have vision and then dare to take risk, put themselves in a position to need God. I would say we're all that desperate. We don't always just know it if we're living self-protective lives. So I want to just talk for a moment about the invitation for each of us to get such a vision of God, from God, for our space, our life, that it puts us in a position of of knowing dependence so we can see God move. Do you know what I'm saying? Speak to that if you would. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, So prayer is a reminder that we're not in control. At its very yeah. basis, it's a reminder to our heart and our soul and our mind that we we have to be able to let God be in control. And when you have those times, those extended times with the Lord, and he starts speaking to you, most of the time, God asks you to do something crazy. If you look at through all the mm-hmm. Bible, when did Jesus ever ask anyone or God ask anyone to do something easy or that they could do on their own strength? He told Moses, go, hey, I want you to free a million slaves. Here's a stick. You know, he told David, I want you to be able to knock down a giant and, and prevent all of these women and children from being slaves to the Philistines. Here's a pebble. You know, like that's the nature of God is that mm-hmm. he invites us into impossible adventures that w- could never happen uh, unless we were depending on him. And to Peter, he said, hey, I want you to walk on water. Come. And, and, and every time you start spending time with Jesus, he will draw you into a moment where you hear that word, that come word. And you're going to have to walk on that word. I had an old missionary friend that told me this. He said, Peter never walked on water. He just walked on the word come. Because Jesus oh, wow. said come. And every step was walking on that word that Jesus gave him. And in my life, uh, to kind of put all these together, I one time had a time, a, a, a extended time of prayer where I had no agenda. And I just said, God, what's, what's on your prayer list? And that's been one of my habits on Wednesdays. I asked the Lord, what's his prayer list? For me, what does he want me to talk to him about? Not just what do I want to talk about? And I felt like the Lord wanted me to pray for a particular country. 
And I said, okay, I pray for this country. And then I tried to pray a little bit more. And all of a sudden, something rose up inside. And I started finding that I was crying and just tears praying for this country. And I felt, wow, something's happening. And, and it turned into a whole series of impossible adventures um, in this persecuted country. I um, got apprehended by the police. All these other things happened. And all these churches have been planted as a result of just that friendship with God leading to an impossible, wow. hey, come. And then taking a step of courage. And so there's this, there's kind of a rhythm to the scriptures where it's, you spend a lot of time with God. He asks you to do something impossible that you can't do without him. You step out in courage and then miracles happen. And uh, where we work with venture, we work in the tough places, the unreached, the, the unsafe and the un, un, unresourced. And I tell people, when you work in the un areas, you see two things. You see miracles and heroes. And, and that ha wow. those happen all the time around us. And we, we actually have 24-7 prayer centers in all the countries that we work in. As a result of this book, someone asked me, he said, where is prayer a line item in your budget? And it convicted me to the core. He said, if you believe in prayer, then where are you investing it? And whatever you believe in makes it to your, your budget. And so we started investing in 24-7 prayer rooms. And the miracles that we've seen, entire villages coming to Christ because of, 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 of a crippled boy walking in a village or incredible miracles that are happening because people put themselves out there. They pray their guts out and they take the courageous step that God asks us to. And both of those things, the act of prayer says, I can't do this. I need you. And then stepping out into what God asks you to do says, God, I, I'm going to put myself in the situation for you. If you don't show up, it's not going to happen. And that loss of control, that is the invitation of Christianity. <laughs> Is, is to, Jesus said, die to yourself, and those who try and save their life will lose it. But those who give their life up, they're going to experience true life like you could never believe. And that's, that's been the rhythm of all those biblical heroes, all the heroes we studied in prayer, all the heroes we get to work with overseas and uh, in our own lives. <laughs> Our church supports Venture, and, and friends, if, if Venture's ringing a bell, like as I said, we had Paul Herkman on a few times, but I don't, for those who've been listening a long time, quite a few years ago, I had this vision for during the Lenten season to engage your body in a physical way to, as your, your one of your phrases was, use your best energies mm -hmm. for the world's greatest needs. So Venture's mm -hmm. not only rescuing girls from human trafficking, feeding the poor, starting churches all over the world, they also are orchestrating and hosting uh, 100 miles bike rides and runs and all kinds of things to raise money for those purposes. So when last one of the last times we had Mark Batterson on and he was training for a century ride coming to Minnesota, my hubby was training as well. These are all connected to venture. And so, you know, Ryan, you're very humble in the way that you gave us a very simple overview, but it, that organization is shaking the world. And I know you've got a target on your back because of what you're doing. And I mean, who would have ever thought that you said, Lord, okay, let's talk about what you want to talk about. Well, let's start with a country. And <laughs> I mean, as you stand here now, are you not just completely in awe of what God has done because you oh. kept following the breadcrumbs where he led you? <laughs> it's unbelievable. I, I, I seriously, yeah, it, it's one of those things that it just, you look back and you're like, well, I know I didn't do that because that is the Lord. And I love that wow. you use the term breadcrumb. Uh, that's a term I use all the time because- I always feel like God leaves breadcrumbs. And the thing about a bread, breadcrumb is you don't know where it's going, but you know who left it. Come on. And, and that's, that's the Lord is he goes to Abraham. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want you to go to Ur. What do I do when I get to Ur? I'll tell you when you get there. You know, what do I do when I get mm -hmm. to the Canaan? I'll tell you when I get there. And that's the way the Lord leads us is he has a breadcrumb. You're like, I, I don't know where this is going, but I sure know who left it. And so I'm going to keep taking a step. I love Thank that you, phrase. So good. So good. Oh my goodness, I'm not even sure where to go. I have so many more questions for you, but I want to just thank you for the risks you've taken for your ministry. Here's what I want to talk about. So you you oversee Venture, you founded Venture. What else mm -hmm. do you have going on? Tell me tell me more what you've got your hands in. Uh, so a couple of uh, travel technology companies, uh, entrepreneur, and that's I, my training. I got an MBA in, in entrepreneurship from St. Thomas. And um, we Venture was kind of a dorm dream. You know, A friend of mine came and said, uh, Aaron, he, the co-founder, he said, Hey, I want to bike across the country to raise money for hurting kids and, and missions. And I was like, that's cool. I didn't even know you're a cyclist. He's like, I'm not. I was like, do you even have a bike? He's like, no. I was like, do, you have any, do you have any money? He's like, no. Do you know how to raise money? No. When do you want to go? He's like, two months. And, and so somehow we pulled it wow. off. I was just out of college. He was still in college. 
uh, and you know, it was one of those, you know, dude, let's do this days. And uh, it raised about $16,000. And for us, that could have been a million bucks. You know, we were just so excited. And, but the idea of challenging ourselves for the challenging areas, doing tough things for people in tough places really resonated. And it kept kind of snowballing. A guy named Don Miller wrote about it in one of his books and that went across the country. And, and, and so I, I ended up starting some companies um, and God's been blessing us to the, so that our companies can cover all the admin of venture. So when people give, 100% of it goes to the programs and projects that I was telling you about. And so I split my time 50-50 between the for-profits and, and venture. And, and then the companies will cover the admin of venture. And then 100% can go straight through because I'm a businessman myself. I don't want people guessing where the money's going. I want it all to be clean. And, and God has just blessed as, as the companies have grown and as and venture has grown. It's been in this tandem. And it's just been a beautiful journey. Wow. And uh, none of it was what I planned out to do, but you, you, you get alone with God, you hear the voice, you take a step in courage, and uh, it's unbelievable what he can do. That's just amazing. So I'm just going to throw this out here before we go to break. Um, I'm praying that one day again, we can do what we did all those years ago with Venture, where we what we did, I wrote a devotional, a 40-day you know, Lenten devotional. So we were wow. looking at spiritual components of our, of our walk with God. And then the physical component was to get as many miles as you could, whether it's biking, mm. walking, what, running. And yeah. uh, we tracked it and people you know, uh, got sponsorship for their miles. And uh, we were able to raise money for Venture and for human trafficking. So I'm hoping and praying we can maybe do that again, friends. Our organization's grown quite a bit. So I'm just throwing that out there. Would you join me in prayer? Because to me, it was so powerful to go through the Lenten season, not only sacrificing, but engaging, you know, so it's not only giving things up, it's adding things to where you're Mm -hmm. going after it for the purpose of a bigger story. So just a thought. All right, we're going to take a break. Did, when we come back, we'll talk more about your book. It's just amazing. Ryan Skoog is my guest. His book, he co-authored with a couple of friends, Lead with Prayer, The Spiritual Habits of a World of World-Changing Leaders. Got a handful of copies to give away today. So inspiring. You can text the word book to 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a minute. Hi, I'm Suzy Larson, host of Suzy Larson Live. Do you still believe God is good? Do you believe He cares about the condition of your soul? Do you believe He still answers prayer? Well, I've released a brand new book titled Waking Up to the Goodness of God, and my whole heart is to point you towards healing and wholeness, to believing again that God is who He says He is, and He's going to do what He promises He'll do. Will you join me on this journey? We are going to have an adventure of a lifetime to be used by God and to trust Him more. Just text the word GOOD to 877-933-2484. You'll receive encouraging texts, prayers, and devotions from me. I'm so happy to do this journey with you. Connecting Faith to Life, Faith Radio. Thanks so much for tuning into Suzy Larson Live, having a really great conversation with Ryan Skoog today. He's so many things. You're just going to have to look him up, a founder of Venture, and uh, he runs other businesses, a co-author of this unbelievable new book titled Lead with Prayer, The Spiritual Habits of World-Changing Leaders. And we're talking about some of the common denominators of just great leaders that they got to interview, over 100 hours of interviews. Uh, Amazing. Traveled all over the world to talk to these dear people. And some of the common denominators were those who are seeking God's face, even beyond seeking His hand, seeking friendship with God, spending time because they love Him, asking God what He wants to talk to them about, letting Him lead the conversation. Gwen writes this, one of the most beautiful gifts that prayer gives us is that it reinforces who we are in Christ. It helps us to recognize, helps us to recognize our identity. We realize how powerful, majestic, and amazing he is, and that his ways are above our ways. That we're so much lower than him, but even so, he invites us to have fellowship and commune with him. We are so unworthy, yet he desires a relationship. Beautiful, Gwen. Thanks for sharing that. You know, you had a good example in your dad, Ryan. You wrote about how he started a, a, he was an entrepreneur as well and started a company and it was growing. And, you know, every small business owner's dream is to be noticed by a fortune company who wants to buy them out. And that dream was almost realized. And then he went to the Lord about it. Tell us that story. Yeah, yeah. It came out of this this bet that we talked about as leaders, Peter Greer and Cameron Doolittle, my co-authors and I, 
talked about every leader has to make a bet. Is it truly worth my time to pray? Is it worth, like, I know I can do these sets of tasks, but the prayer is like ethereal. You have to believe that it's, it's productive and you have to make that bet. And in our family, there is no question that prayer was worth, uh, you know, the time it took to pray. Uh, because of because of a story that happened to my dad. Was, my dad was an entrepreneur. He spent 10 years building up his company and he got an exclusive deal with a Fortune 50 company. And this is the kind of deal that like, you know, entrepreneurs work their whole life to try and get. And his business partner was like, we've made it. This is finally it. But he decided to take, a, you know, an hour of prayer. And, and he said, I'm going to sleep on it. I'm going to pray on it. And he went and he prayed and he felt like the Lord said, absolutely not. Run away, run away. And, and so he told his business partner who was through his mind, couldn't believe what happened, that they were to reject it. As it turned out, that company shocked Wall Street and the world six months later by declaring bankruptcy. And that bankruptcy would have taken down my dad's company with him or with wow. it. And so the Lord saved him. And so one hour of prayer saved 10 years of blood, sweat, tears, hard work. And so in our family, we're, we always talk about that legend is it's always worth the time to pray. It's always worth it to take some time to, to hear from the Lord first. It can save 10 years of work. And so that's a mm. trade-off we want to make every day. Yeah. I want to say it was either William McDonald or Warren Wearsby who said there's enough flesh in any one of us to single-handedly take down any great work of God. And that's <laughs> that should make us tremble a little bit, you know, a lot bit actually, yeah. when we're going at it in our own strength. And uh, Oh, I, it, man. Yeah, go ahead. So true. No, I was yeah. going to say, we, we actually talked to a leader who was um, on his way to a moral failure, and, and the Lord, through wow. his prayer life, stopped him. Another leader was going to do a denominational split, and his, he started a practice called the examine, where he asked the Lord, what am I doing today that pleases you? What am I doing today that didn't please you? And because of that prayer rhythm, he, he heard the Lord say, what are you doing? And he had this moment, and he repented, and it stopped a denominational split. So these practices are safeguards. They're powerful safeguards in our lives. Wow. Uh, some of the stats um, on those who make prayer a priority, we just got a couple minutes left, but this is from Barna. 91% of respondents feel more aligned to the mission of their organization. 85% believe God's more clearly accomplishing his work through the ministry. 78% agree that they feel less stressed in their day-to-day -day responsibilities due to corporate prayer. 70% agree that their productivity has increased. Wow. I don't even know what to say, but except, wow, I want to just re revisit this again. Every prayer we pray mm -hmm. is like hiding a canister in the rubble of this world. If you could have mm -hmm. the whole Western church, you know, captive audience, I know you give them this book and they should see this, but if you just had a short amount of time behind yeah. a microphone, how would you charge us? <laughs> I, would, I would actually want to ignite our imaginations and say, imagine what could happen if leaders returned to their knees and started modeling prayer and growing mm -hmm. in prayer and led cultures of praying people, if leaders aren't praying, the people they lead aren't praying. But imagine what could happen. It could change everything. If we get this right, Jesus said all the other things after our seeking, if we get that right, all the other things are added. And so I just want to stir the imaginations of people of what does it look like if you not just became a person who prays occasionally, but became truly a praying leader where you lead, wherever you lead, and then built a culture of prayer and invested in prayer where you lead, that would absolutely change our nation. It could change mm -hmm. everything. And so it, really, I want to just ignite everyone's imagination for what their life can look like as a praying leader. So good. Got one minute left. Would love to know this. What do you know about God now? Ryan, that you didn't know as well, maybe, or at all, five, 10 years ago? Oh, man, your questions are so good. <laughs> I would say uh, what I didn't understand was that when God is inviting us into prayer, he's inviting us into the fellowship of the Trinity. In John 17, Jesus said, God, I want them to know you the way I know you. And so the, the, the invitation to prayer, I didn't realize it, is to be a part of the most exclusive group in the world. It's God's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, into that fellowship of the Trinity. And, and I, I know that sounds kind of wild and mystical, but I, I, I had no idea that the invitation of Jesus is so much greater than any invitation we could ever imagine to be with him. And so that's, that's probably the first one. And then the second one is 
It, it, it's a super simple story. My kids and I, we talk about our, um, my dog bear, or sorry, we talked about how nature um, reminds us of God. And my, and my kid, you know, he was about seven. He said, dad, what does bear teach us about dog or about God, our dog bear? And I said, I think, I think what, what bear our dog teaches us is he's always happy to see us. And mm-hmm. God, every minute we pray, he's happy to see us. He's Love not it. thinking about what we didn't do or what we did missed or whatever. Every time you go to pray, he's happy to see you. And I didn't realize that about God until more recently. That wow. the, the, the love of God is that he's just every moment, every minute you pray, it's not guilt for what you didn't do. He's just happy to see you. Ryan, you got to come back again. This was so fantastic. I wish you could see all the texts coming in. You'd be so encouraged. Friend, thank you so much for tuning in. You've been hearing me talk about this prayer movement, getting your prayer people and pray together. Find them. Start praying. We'll meet you back here next time. Thanks for listening to Suzy Larson Live. Podcasts like mine are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes and give now.